My talk today is about the future of search. But I first wanted to highlight what the uh, Israel office has done for us in terms of their contribution to search. Because it's been really significant. Uh, as Yossi uh, just mentioned, we have had a number of really significant search products that have been built here in our Israel R&D Center. Uh, they include Google Suggest, uh, our overall spelling uh, technology, the, the Did You Mean, it appears on top of the, the search results page that undoubtedly is the best spell checker uh, in the world. Uh, we, they've also worked on trends, uh, as well as our insights for search, looking at our overall traffic volume uh, and, uh, and analyzing it and helping our users do and our advertisers do the same. So it's been a really, really wonderful effort. They also are working on a few new and upcoming things that are going to be really exciting. You'll see some of those launch over, over the, the next few months. Um, but for me, uh, one personal thing about me is that I'm not a morning person. I don't like to get up early in the morning. I'm a night owl. And uh, so for me, for the past year, I actually have been getting up early, about once a week, to meet with our Israel engineers. And I do that because the people who work here are so phenomenal and their impact on search is so important that it actually inspires me to get up in the morning and, and call into Haifa and, and Tel Aviv uh, as sometimes as early as seven or eight. <laughs> so uh, it's just a really wonderful team here and I'm really grateful to their efforts uh, and I think it's, that Yossi has built a wonderful center and a great environment for innovation here. So let's talk a little bit about where the future of search is going. Uh, basically, when we think about the future of search, I think it's going to evolve along three different axes. Interactions, the way people actually interact with search will change. Comprehensiveness, how much information we have, the type of information that you can find through the search engine will ultimately really change. As well as understanding. Today, our understanding of the web and the information we search is just not that profound. There's a lot that we could do that could actually increase our understanding and as a result, really enhance the relevance of our search results. So let's start off with uh, interactions. How will people interact with the future? And you know, for a lot of this, this is sort of the sci-fi vision. Of, you know, could you be wearing some kind of crazy headset and actually have the information that you need streamed to you when you see someone's name tag actually doing the search, when you see this or that? Uh, could you actually get that information in real time? A lot of those sci-fi visions are actually not that far away when you look at some of what Google has released recently in search. Uh, our overall vision for search is we th sort of call this an omnivorous search box. So today we have a, a search box that eats keywords. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a search box where you could just feed it anything? You could feed it keywords, you could feed it concepts, you could feed it photos or, or, uh, or sound streams, and actually just have it analyzed and bring you back uh, results on any of that. That's really our vision. Could we actually, what, what can we build into a query? Can we actually take a user's full context where they are, or what they were just looking at, and, and and try and find relevant information related to that. Basically, if you think about how interactions can change, you can think about how a query might change in its form in the future, and as a result, what we might be able to do in terms of bringing people uh, great and relevant information. The first thing that we've released recently in this event, in this vein is something called Google Goggles. How many people here have seen Google Goggles or heard about it? So the idea here is this is a mobile application. But with your cell phone, you can take a picture. You can take a picture of a landmark. You can take a picture of a label, say on a product. Uh, if it's a landmark, we'll recognize the landmark. We're capable of recognizing uh, several thousand, I think now close to 10,000 landmarks around the world uh, and doing the search for that. So if you take a picture uh, of the Eiffel Tower, if you take a picture probably of the Baha'i Gardens here in, in Haifa, it will actually recognize that and bring you back results for the Baha'i Gardens. Uh, and it also is capable of looking at labels and doing an OCR, pulling the, la pulling the text out of those labels and doing a search on that information. But basically this is the idea of just, you could basically say, what's that? Or tell me about that. And actually use your cell phone as the pointer and clicker and use that photo that's taken as the input method to search. If you think about this, it opens up all kinds of searches that weren't possible to be done before. You said, you know, what kind of bird is that over there? How would you ever formulate a query with keywords to try and express that, right? You could actually just now just take a picture of it and 
and, ha and have us try and find what you're looking for in the photo and, and do the analysis and bring you the results. So we're really excited about what this kind of visual search could do in terms of the future of search. And if you think about how much people search today, you already see that, that users of the internet search a lot. But if you think about when we have new types of interactions, how many more searches people could do a day and how much more in interesting information is relevant to their, concept, their, their, their context they could see, we're really, really excited about what can happen there. The second thing that we've recently released is uh, Google uh, Voice Search. Uh, this has been an application that's also available uh, on our Android platforms uh, and on iPhone. Um, and uh, how many people here have tried Google Voice Search? Anyone? This, this one actually, it's an, it's an application that's installed on your phone and you can just talk to the search engine. And we actually do voice to, uh, speech to text on your input and run a search for those keywords. So when you're walking down the street, you don't want to just sit there and type on your, on your keyboard or your virtual keyboard, uh, you can actually just talk to the search engine. It's a much easier way to actually enter searches on the go, especially in a mobile environment. We're really excited because again, this is leading towards that vision of the omnivorous search box. Can we take photos? Can we take spoken words? And can we do something reasonable with them in terms of providing people the information that they're looking for? The next thing that we have really been focused on is comprehensiveness. Basically, in the world of search, we want to provide answers. And we can't provide answers unless we actually have them available to index and return. So we've been looking at how can we overall increase the comprehensiveness. And I have to say that the growth of this over time is pretty staggering. Um, we, when I started off at, at Google, we had 30 million pages uh, in our index. Uh, and we basically thought that was both as big as the web was. We were crawling everything we could find. Uh, and today we're literally crawling and, and having our index hundreds of billions of pages. So the scale of the internet, and the scale of the search, and the way this has changed over time uh, is really dramatic. But also people's expectations, their understanding of you know, what's on the web that's publicly available, what's on the web that's available only to them. How can we provide a search that really maps to their mental model of, if I've seen it, I should be able to find it again. Uh, and, and we're really, we're really interested overall in advancing along comprehensiveness. So we've been bringing up uh, different types of new rich results. One of the big initiatives we've had here is something called universal search, where we take, we right now have many different search engines, a search engine for images, one for news, one for books, one for maps, blogs, you get the idea. And we've been stitching them all together into one main search engine. So when you use Google, your query actually goes to all of those different search engines. We get results from all of them and we stitch them together. And now what we've been doing, we've had universal search for the past few years, we now have been looking at how can we enrich those even more. So for example, if someone types in a query, notice that on the query here, Bar Raffaele, is that how you say it? We're trying to get some local examples, but anyway, Bar Raffaele. Uh, uh, we are working on, you know, you notice there's no mention of photos in that, in that query, yet we know that when people look for bar, that they basically really want to see photos. And so where you have this larger photo block that appears on the top of the, on the top of the page. Usually we try and make sure that they're not quite as racy as that, <laughs> but apparently those are maybe the types of photos people look for for her. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> The greater, uh, we've also been working on introducing new types of results. Uh, so last fall, one of the things that we've, we've consistently seen is that music, over all time, we've looked at all of our searches over all time, and if you look at the top 10 search terms of all time, two of them are music related. So the second most uh, common term is, is music, and I think the number nine term is lyrics. So users are constantly looking for music related queries. And, and up until we released this feature, we actually didn't have great coverage of music. Uh, and now what we have is we have the ability to search for bands or artist names, song names, album names. We also have lyric search. Uh, and our teams here have worked really hard on building a great lyric search. So you can actually just hear a phrase of something on the radio, type it in, and get a good result. And not only do you get the result of who the band is, what, what the name of the song is, you actually can play the song from the results page. So each of those links there alongside the, the image here of Lady Gaga, you can actually click on those and those bring up a player uh, hosted by uh, I Like and Lala, as, uh, uh, for, for the time being, those are our two partners. They actually do play right there on your, on your result page. So you can verify that is the song you heard on the radio once you've found it. 
We all, the, the other piece that we focused on in terms of comprehensiveness is looking at new media that have been uh, cropping up around the web. And one of the latest uh, forms of media that's become very pervasive on the web is updates. Updates on Facebook, on, on, on MySpace, on Twitter. And we released a new real-time search that we think really improves our overall comprehensiveness of our results. Uh, and so this was released in, in December. We actually have Twitter in its, in its, uh, its complete form. Um, we actually have a special feed where we get the tweets at the same time Twitter gets the feed. So we get the feed in real time and we're able to search it. Uh, and we also have been searching public updates from both MySpace and Facebook. And what this allows us to do is when something really topical and timely happens, like an earthquake, we actually are able to surface those uh, updates on the results page in real time. So they show up here, and as new updates appear, you get a scroll bar here on the right, so you can actually, as new tweets or new updates come in, you can actually see them right on your result page. This is an interesting case study that the team found about a month or so after they released the feature, which is that we had an earthquake, uh, and it happened around 10.10 a.m. By 10.11, basically the Geological Service knew, knew that there was an earthquake right away, so they had on their website that there was an earthquake, but they didn't know what magnitude, where it was, really anything yet. But by 10.12, our real-time one box triggered. So within two minutes of when the earthquake happened, if you think about how long it takes for you to actually just even type up a tweet, send it in, have it go to Twitter and us, get it indexed and get it on our result page, less than two minutes after the earthquake occurred, it was already appearing on Google's search results page. And this is, you know, I really think this is a huge testimony to our engineering capabilities, that the fact that they, we've got a system that is that efficient, uh, and, and it's, just, it's also the power of the internet, that the communication can spread that quickly and we can be returning these as results that fast after. And the really remarkable thing is that um, basically the USGS didn't make this publicly available through their feed until a full 10 minutes later. So we beat them by almost eight minutes in terms of having this in, the, in real time. So uh, this is something that we're really excited about, but it gives you an idea when you look at things like the enhanced image feature, the music feature, the real time feature. We have a real commitment to finding all of the information that's available on the web, also indexing new media uh, like updates, and making sure that our search provides the most relevant information that's available anywhere. Uh, and we've also worked on localizing our, our search to as many different places uh, as we possibly can. So I think now we're currently in running in uh, just about just over 100 languages. I think we're currently at 110 languages, and we are running in about 160 countries. Uh, and sort of an interesting uh, experiment that we did here because in many of these cases, we actually have had volunteer users around the world using an engine and translating our website for us. Uh, this was inspired by a small startup where, uh, called the Weather Underground. Uh, and we used to work really, when we were doing the localization, this was back when I was an engineer, I, uh, we would have in our web server, we pull all the strings, send them to get localized, leave all these sort of if-else statements, depending on whether or not we had the, the translation, wait around. And we were running our website in about 14 languages. And my friend Alan was running his Weather Underground site in like 40 languages and he only had like five people. And I said, Alan, how do you, how do you run your, your website in so many languages? <laughs> like, I'm, you know, we're dying trying to run our website in like 14. And, uh, and he basically said, well, I, we have people who use Weather Underground all over the world. And when they mail us, he's like, I, you know, they'll say things like, you know, I am Weather Underground's number one fan in Croatia. And he'll be like, excellent, do you speak Croatian? <laughs> because if you do, and you can tell me how to say Fahrenheit, Celsius, cloudy, sunny, etc., etc., I can bring up Croatian weather underground. Uh, and he basically internationalized a site like that. So we picked up that idea, and this sort of goes back to USC's comment that ideas can come from everywhere. They come from inside the company, they come from outside the company. We picked up that idea, put together a little console, and let our, uh, and, and let our users do the translations. And today we actually have the largest volunteer uh, translation workforce uh, in the world uh, online because we actually have more than a million people who translate Google into all of those different languages and really make the search available everywhere. And so it's really great that not only do we have that much comprehensiveness, but that people in those many, in that, that many different countries, that many different languages have access to the service. And speaking of translation, we also have been making a lot of headway lately on machine translation. I'm told here, at least I heard a little bit about this at the Garage Geeks yesterday, that maybe our, our machine translation 
here in Hebrew isn't quite perfect yet. <laughs> uh, and obviously, I'm sure as you're all very aware, like Hebrew is actually one of the hardest uh, languages to, to translate uh, in and out of. Uh, but we actually have some of the most accurate uh, tra machine translation software available anywhere. And this is really related to search because this is something that can unlock the power of the content for everyone, a speaker of any language. The idea is, imagine if we took your query and we could translate it into 50 languages or 100 languages, search the web in all of those languages, and then bring you back your result. Basically means that the answer to your question is written down anywhere on the web, regardless of what language it's written in, we could bring you that answer. This is one reason why we're really excited about the power of translation. It also very much helps our overall uh, our overall efforts in things like apps. You can imagine doing uh, multilingual chat, actually chatting in your native language and chatting with someone else who, who doesn't speak that language and doing so seamlessly. But we're really excited about the advances that have happened lately in machine translation, what that means in terms of comprehensiveness for search. The last area I wanted to talk about is understanding. How can we build a better understanding of the facts that are on the web? Right now we have a really good understanding of where words occur, but we don't really understand different concepts. Uh, so for example, what's the population of Israel? We don't really have an understanding built into the search engine that would say, okay, well, you want to answer with some sort of number of people. That basically we need some kind of number followed by a unit uh, in expression of, of population. We don't have that kind of intelligence. Yet we really think as search advances, we'll need something like that. Uh, so in terms of the uh, different efforts we have uh, around understanding that have shown a lot of promise lately, one of them is uh, location personalized search. So for some time we've had personalized search where for users who turn, turn on the feature, we keep track of your searches and your search clicks, ultimately more fewer search results to be more of your liking and more relevant to you. But recently we've also included location in that. In terms of location really is a first order object in search. We found to really provide the most relevant results for our users we really do need to know their overall location. And that means that when you type something like restaurants and you're here, you get restaurants in Haifa or restaurants in Tel Aviv as possible completions. And so this really builds on the suggest work that's been done here, the personalized search work that's been done here, as well as some of our location work. Really pulling all these different efforts together and ultimately delivering much better suggestions and much better search results to our users. We've also tried to understand our users' social context. So uh, last fall, we released our social search. Uh, the idea here is we try and intuit a social graph for our users. This is based on either Google profiles or their chat contacts in Gmail. And again, this only occurs when they, when they opt into using the feature. We intuit a social graph, and then we try and figure out of the users that you follow on Twitter, and of these relationships that we, that we have found, basically, what have your friends written on the web? So it means when you do something like search for New Zealand, not only do you get, as part of your core web results, the best pages anywhere on the web for New Zealand, but you also get things your friends have written about New Zealand. So for example, this is my friend Jeremy and my friend Simon, this is their travel logs from their, their trips to New Zealand, where I can actually see this is where they went, this is where they stayed, et cetera, et cetera. So not only do I get the most relevant information anywhere on the web, I also get information that's incredibly relevant and personal to me. So I can mail them and say, you know, look, I see that you went here. Was it really worth your time or not? And, and there's really a, the chance to see information that's incredibly personal and relevant to you based on your social circle. We also have done a lot of work on data extraction. This goes back to my example around population, of trying to understand what are different facets of information, what are different values and different types of, of information. And we've pulled together this really impressive technology demonstration in the form of Google Squared. How many people have looked at Google Squared? So this is something that's available on our lab site, uh, and it's an experimental feature, but it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. So what you can see we're doing here is if you type in something like endangered species, and the queries that you do here should be something that are ca like categorical queries, uh, like you know, small breeds of dogs or Tel Aviv hotels. And what we do is we try and find items that are of that class. So of the class endangered species, we can find things like bald eagles and snow leopards and polar bears. We can then understand and find a picture of each of those items, and then pull up 
different facets and values. And by the way, these values are dynamic and computed for each different type of, of item that you enter in. So for, for example, in this case, we can tell that a description is a natural thing to include here, but the family uh, of, the, of the animal kingdom that that species is a part of is something that we think is relevant. Because basically, as we have found these facts around the web, we see that in many cases, the family is noted alongside the endangered species. So this is something that's done entirely on a dynamic level. They're basically building a database of facts from the web at large. It means when you actually go into that database and pull the data, we can find the types of data values that are most relevant to that particular type of query. This shows an idea of just because of the richness of the web, because there's so much uh, information available on the web, and because we can do so much computation out on it, we can actually build a really rich understanding uh, of the information that's there. Uh, and we also believe in getting answers fast. So taking that same data that is pulled in through uh, Google Squared, we try and see can we actually find facts. So this means you can type things into Google, like the Empire State Building height, and we actually will pull that fact. And that fact is, again, something where we look, we look across the entire web, we try and see where do we see a fact pattern that could answer this query, uh, and is that corroborated across many different sources? So we actually can see, based on the collective wisdom of what appears on the web, what's the answer to that factual query. Uh, so overall, in terms of the future of search, we really think that we're just getting started. Uh, people like to talk a lot about 80-20 problems, where the first 20% of the work gets you 80% of the solution. And to get it just that much more perfect, you've got to do 80% more work to get that last 20%. And um, we really think that that really is very much the case in search, and we're just at the start of that evolution. If you think about it, search uh, ultimately will be a science. It'll be a science that lasts for you know, multiples of hundreds of years. Uh, but right now, we're just in that very first period of infancy, which just makes it a really fun and amazing thing to work on because we're constantly coming up with new discoveries, new ideas, new ways of doing search uh, that are really exciting. And in fact, we actually think that search is a really extreme version of, of an 80-20 problem. We actually think it's more like a 90-10 problem. Right now, today, we have a search that we think is pretty good, and it might feel like you know, search is solved, or it's 90% of the way there. We actually think that search is only 10% solved, and actually 90% of what will ultimately come to be search in 20 years, and 50 years, and 100 years is done today. And there'll be amazingly rich opportunities along those three axes of interactions, comprehensiveness, and understanding that can build just amazingly powerful uh, search engines and tools to really help our users. So with that, thank you, and I will hand over to Professor Nizam.